Good evening and welcome to the Coon Rapids City Council meeting for Tuesday, May 16th, 2017. If you could please rise and join us for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Councilmember Kristoviak. Present. Councilmember Kicker. Here. Councilmember Demmer. Here. Councilmember Geisler. Here. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Councilmember Wells. Here. Mayor Cook. Here. Thank you. First item on our agenda is to adopt this evening's agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Wells. Any changes or corrections, discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion carries. Uh, the first item on our agenda is the uh, Armed Forces Day Proclamation. And this will actually coincide with uh, the Army Band playing over at Epiphany on Saturday. And, um, and I'll be able to read the proclamation then and present it to General George Steiner. But I'm actually going to read it because it's a really important proclamation. And... Uh, Whereas, since the earliest days of our union, America has been blessed with an unbroken chain of patriots willing to give of themselves so their fellow citizens might live free. Whenever our nation has come under attack, courageous men and women in uniform have risen to her defense. Whenever our liberties have come under assault, our service members have responded with resolve. Time and again, these heroes have sacrificed to sustain that powerful promise that we hold so dear, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And on Armed Forces Day, we honor those who serve bravely and sacrifice selflessly in our name, and whereas our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coast guardsmen represent the best of the American character, they serve with integrity and do whatever the country they love asks of them, choosing flag over fortune, and service over self-interest. Year after year, tour after tour, their dedication to protecting us at home and preserving our ideals never wavers. Their commitment to each other never falters. They are the few who carry the remarkable weight of our entire nation, and in their example, we see why America is, and always will be, the greatest country on earth. And whereas, today, we pause to express our gratitude, mindful that words and ceremonies are not enough, and that our thanks extend not only to those in uniform, but also to the families who serve alongside them. We are bound by a sacred obligation to ensure our service members and their loved ones have the resources and benefits they have earned and deserve, and only when we uphold this trust do we truly show our appreciation for our armed forces. Now, therefore, I, Jerry Cook, Mayor of the City of Coon Rapids, on behalf of the Coon Rapids City Council, hereby proclaim Saturday, May 20th, 2017, as Coon Rapids Salute to Our Armed Forces Day. I call upon all Coon Rapids residents to display the flag of the United States at their home, to learn more about military service by participating in local observances of the day, and encourage all Americans to volunteer for organizations that provide support to our troops and their families. Proclaimed this 16th day of May, 2017. So. And we have a special guest with us this evening. Uh, we have Steve Markison here from the Twin City Gateway Visitors Bureau. And he is here to present a check and deliver some information. Uh, you're, li <laughs> <laughs> you're live. Just down at the bottom. Down the right, right this way right here. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. We sent over our biggest gun to help you out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> nope. Well, it's a good send thing our security is okay. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> send them three hundred dollars. <laughs> they'll have your file there for you. After the virus that's going around, you right. can't take too many chances. 
For the record, I'm Steve Markison, the Executive Director of Twin Cities Gateway, which is the Regional Visitors Bureau that represents the City of Coon Rapids and eight other member cities in the North Metro. Honorable Mayor, Council Members, Staff, and Residents, it's on behalf of our Board of Directors, it's a pleasure to be here today. Just want to give you a little overview about who and what we are and the kinds of things we're doing to promote tourism in the area. Uh, before we get started at the local level, it's important to recognize what tourism in Minnesota means. It's about $14.4 billion in gross sales annually, which is $40 million a day. There are not many uh, industries that generate that kind of revenue day in, day out. Over 250,000 jobs, 11% of all private sector employment, 5.1 billion in salaries and wages, most of which are spent in the local communities in which they are uh, employed. 930 million in sales tax revenue, 17% of all Minnesota sales taxes are generated by the tourism industry. Some estimates are without a thriving industry, uh, we'd all as homeowners be paying somewhere from 600 to 1100 dollars more per year in taxes to support the services that we need. So the industry uh, does provide funding that for a lot of the critical needs of the state. 17 percent of all Minnesota state sales taxes. And as you can see in Renoka County it's 550 million a year and over 12,000 jobs. And in Ramsey County and Twin Cities Gateway strides both counties uh, over $2 billion a year. Surprising to most, the metro area generates over 60% of that $14.4 billion. You know, we used to always think of tourism as a cabin up north and lake country and those kinds of things, but that's not the case anymore. So what happens when more visitors come to town? I like to say magic happens, because it has a lot more impact uh, than most people realize. Tourism is economic development's first date. Tourism attracts new residents, attracts a strong workforce, new businesses, and new development. This is some research that was done by Longwoods International. Uh, they surveyed five different states, including Minnesota, and this is what happens when more visitors come to town. I'm not going to go through all of these columns in detail, but I just want to point out the first column on the left is the uh, impact it has, in this case, the perception of the community. If, if uh, people see tourism advertising for a community or a destination area, 65% of them have a higher perception. The middle column is if they actually visit the destination. So in this case, 70% of people who visit the destination have a better perception of that community. And if they see tourism advertising and visit the destination, there's a 146% lift. So you can see from an economic development standpoint, you know, getting visitors into town to see what uh, we have to offer, what a great place it is, really lifts the perception of the community. The community attracts a strong workforce because people consider it a great place to start a career. Again, you can see if they see the advertising, if they visit, if they see the advertising and visit. Uh, for many of us, one of the things we hear across the board, regardless of industry, is the challenge in attracting a qualified workforce. So hopefully the visitors we bring to town and into the destination area get a good feeling for it and think, hey, that would be a good place to, uh, to live and work. New businesses are attracted. You can see the lift, particularly if you're in economic development or a community development, 194% against a 100% index see that community as a great place to start a new business. Maybe they're thinking about a new business, maybe they're thinking about an expansion of, of an existing business or another location for a business that they already own. So the common perception among many is that when visitors come to town, the only people that really benefit are the lodging industry, the hotels and so forth. This is where the visitor dollars are spent. 21% of their spending is on lodging. 
Food and beverage is 24%, retail 17%, 16% on recreation, 16% on transportation, and 6% on other. So what that means is 79% of all visitor spending is spent on Main Street and throughout the community doing the things that they actually came for. Nobody comes to town to stay in a hotel. As nice as our hotels are, they come for another reason and they spend their money throughout the community. Uh, Twin Cities Gateway is funded entirely by the local option lodging tax, which each of our 23 hotels throughout our nine member cities uh, contribute to when a visitor stays in one of those hotel rooms. Typically, uh, you, would, you pay the same when you travel to other communities or, or elsewhere. There's a 3% lodging tax that's collected on each visitor, and uh, this is the revenue that we've generated. We started in 2010. You can see significant growth from 2010 through uh, uh, 2016. Uh, that's with the same number of hotel rooms. No additional hotels were built during that period of time. Obviously, in 2010, we were coming out of the recession. Business has been steady. Since, we're starting to level out a little bit now. So our strategic objectives uh, for the coming year and beyond are to reach identified target markets, drive hotel page website traffic, increase non-peak period business. We're pretty soft in uh, the first quarter and a little, little bit in the fourth quarter as well, so we're spending much of our marketing dollars on those times a year to try and generate business during, uh, during that, that time. Many of you have probably never seen or heard a Twin Cities Gateway ad. There's a reason for that. We spend our money out of town trying to bring people in. So we spend a lot of money in Fargo, Duluth, Winnipeg, all across northern Minnesota, the Dakotas, Iowa, and then the Wisconsin. About 80 plus percent of our business comes from those markets and over half of our business comes from, uh, from within Minnesota itself. This is just one example of uh, the kind of advertising that we do. This one happened to run in Midwest Living and in the USA Today Travel Guide. So as I said, we do a lot of it out of the metro area. Uh, most of what we spend is on digital marketing because 76% of people plan their trips online the days of calling your Chamber of Commerce or your Convention of Visitors Bureau and asking them to mail you a brochure are well behind us. I uh, can't remember, the, I think the last time I did it was probably 10 years ago and the brochure arrived after I'd already made the trip. So. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we did this year is initiated, the, the board uh, approved the, the addition of a, another uh, uh, position within the organization to focus on sports marketing, which is one of the fastest growing tourism segments in the country. Uh, obviously, with having the National Sports Center as the, in, our, uh, in our home and in our backyard in Twin Cities Gateway, they generate about four million visitors a year to that facility. But the board really wanted to, uh, to expand that and try to get more events in within our member cities, each of whom has wonder facilities, be it community centers or ice facilities or ball fields, your, your significant parks improvements that the city is doing and Sand Creek in particular are just spectacular. So here's a couple of events that uh, we've been involved in and in attracting uh, two Coon Rapids in particular United States Softball Association Early Bird, Early Bird Softball Tournament, the MYSA State uh, District Soccer Tournament, the Midwest Super Dual Softball Tournament, men's fast pitch. Surprisingly, fast pitch is played all around us, but very few people play it in the metro area. So if we can do an annual fast pitch tournament, which we want to do and to grow, That'll bring all uh, non-metro teams in. That's our goal, to bring people from outside. We want as many metro area teams to play as, as possible, but we want to bring teams in from out of state who are going to bring their families, rent some hotel rooms, go to some restaurants, uh, and so on. And then a state church softball tourney. We have also created some events 
via partnerships, we're going to do a MEA volleyball tournament at Anoka Ramsey Community College. Those will be all out of town teams and they will be using Coon Rapids hotels for their lodging while they're here. Turkey shoot's kind of fun. Um, we're going to use the outdoor rink at the Coon Rapids Ice Center to do a mid-November broomball tournament. As soon as the ice goes down, you're one of the few places that do that. Uh, Al Stoffaker, who is our sports marketing director, was just named to the Broomball Hall of, Hall, World Hall of Fame, and uh, he says it's interesting that very few people have played broomball outside. On the other hand, I never played broomball inside. So, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it, it depends, but there are already teams from Indiana and others that are planning to come for this. We're also hosting next year in 2018 the National Broomball Championships and the World Broomball Championships at the National Sports Center. So this is an event that we want to build on an annual basis and grow and get more and more teams participating. We're also working with the, with the CRIC staff to uh, promote a new ho girls' holiday hockey tournament where they will be using both the indoor and outdoor sheets. So a lot, of, a lot of teams have never played outdoors either, and with the facilities that you have, it's a wonderful experience. One thing I wanted to mention that of that $938,000 budget, 17.5% of that is on administrative and overhead expenses. The balance goes into marketing and promotion. We operate, uh, I don't look like it, but we're a pretty lean and mean organization. <laughs> I'm not, but the organization is. But that means that we're putting more, far more money into marketing and promotion than similar organizations across the uh, metro or, or throughout the state. And with that, it's our, on behalf of the <coughs> Twin Cities Gateway Visitors Bureau and its Board of Directors, we are happy to present a grant for 2017 in the amount of $23,878 to the city to use to market and promote its events and assets to visitors and hope that we can welcome them into and throughout the community. With that, I'm open to any questions or comments. That's excellent. Um, maybe you would share with us, who's the largest contributor to the, the to that board? City of Coon Rapids. I thought so. <laughs> city of Coon which also has the most hotels, so yeah. it's not a uh, <laughs> it's not a coincidence that. Uh, but the city no. city of Coon Rapids generates the uh, largest share of the local option lodging tax. The city is well represented on our board of directors by Mayor Cook and Manager Stemwettle, so uh, and they're very actively engaged and participatory in our organization. We're delighted to have them on the board uh, representing. Not only the city of Coon Rapids, but our other eight member cities. Yeah, it's it's really it's wonderful how they all work together. All of those events over at the sports center, I don't know what percentage of those people from out of town stay at Coon Rapids motels, but I think it's a lot of them. Yeah, because there's there's only two relatively small properties in Blaine, so so yeah. many of those visitors do stay in our other other member cities, and it has a tremendous economic <laughs> impact on the entire uh, entire region. Any questions from anyone? Thank you. All right, and I'm I'm happy to say that you've agreed to stay another year with the with the visitors bureau as I of have today, indeed. right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Is okay. there one of those giant checks, or we're just gonna? No, we don't have the giant check. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. It's in it's in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't go through our depository very well anyway. Right. So. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Markison. Yeah, we have to motion to accept that. I don't recall. Yes. Okay, good. All right, so um, maybe looking through a, a motion. Mayor? Yes, Councilmember Chris. I'd like to make a motion to adopt resolution 17.56, accepting the 2017 member city marketing grant in the amount of $23,878. Second. Motion by Griscoviak, second by Demmer. And would that motion also include approving the 2017 Member City Marketing Grant Agreement? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Perfect. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. 
All right. Our next item is to uh, uh, the approval of the meeting from the reconvened meeting minutes from the local board of appeal and equalization. Councilmember Geisler. Um, I would like to move approval of our amended. Um, everyone should have an updated copy of our local board of appeal and equalization reconvened meeting minutes from May 2nd. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Johnson. Discussion? Nope. And, well, just kind of a, there was a, a the original one had an the, the, two, two the, things mixed from, yeah. you know. So I, the, the first one was the approval of the minutes, minutes, and it said that, that I have, and that it said that uh, that you that, that passed unanimously, and the second one was the uh, retracting an appeal, and that one said the motion passed with six to answer. nothing with you abstaining, and they were just they were inverted. just flipped. Yes, yeah. so we have it corrected, and we're all good. Yeah. All right. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Didn't mean to step on your toes, or I just happened to have it in front of me there, so. We knew what we were doing. All right. Sounds good. Uh, next item is the approval of the minutes from May 2nd. Motion. Um, Council Member Demmer. Move to approve the meeting <laughs> minutes from May 2nd. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Kicker. Discussion or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And those minutes are approved. Next, we're on to our consent agenda. We have five items on there. The first one is to approve a quit claim deed with Anoka County conveying the right of way and easements for reconstruction of University Avenue. Uh, the city entered into a joint powers agreement with Anoka County for the reconstruction of University Avenue between Main Street and Northdale Boulevard. As part of the agreement, the city agreed to convey all necessary drainage, ponding, and utility easements to the county for this project. So that's what this motion will do. Oh, so I was already waiting for a motion. It's, it's a consent <laughs> agenda. So it will be, uh, we'll be approving the quit claim deed with Anoka County conveying right of way and easements for reconstruction of University Avenue. Item our next item, item six, adopt resolution 17-53, accepting donations for the Sand Creek Park grand opening event. And the grand opening event for the newly renovated Sand Creek Park is set to take place on May 26th, 2017. WSB and Associates and Peterson Companies have been critical partners in the development and construction of the new park and its facilities. And these generous donations will be used to offset some of the event costs and to assist in purchasing signage and promotional materials. Promotional materials will acknowledge WSB and Associates and Peterson Companies as sponsors for the grand opening event. So we'll be adopting resolution 17-53, accepting the WSB and Associates and Peterson Companies donations, totaling $1,000 for the Sand Creek Park grand opening event on May 26, 2017. Um, next item on agenda is to accept the drainage and utility easements from Parent Custom Homes, LLC. On April 4th, the City Council approved a lot split for Parcel A, located at 10334 Mississippi Boulevard. And uh, the, let's see, bu, 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 bu. as a condition of the approval of the registered land survey, there's a five-foot drainage and utility easement that shall be provided by the property owner to the city. So this motion is to accept easements for drainage and utility purposes from Parent Custom Homes, LLC, over portions of the property on parcel A and B located on Mississippi Boulevard. Next item on the agenda is to adopt resolution 17-58, accepting donation for movies in the park. And on Friday, oh, so actually we're asked, being asked to authorize the acceptance of a $3,700 donation from the Community Strength Foundation to help fund the two movies in the park. And it's important that we point out Scott Lotta is here tonight from the Community Strength Foundation. And you didn't bring one of those big checks either, right? Okay. <laughs> On Friday, May 26th, the city will be celebrating the grand reopening of Sand Creek Park with a showing of Zootopia at the Park, 1008 Northdale Boulevard. The family fun night begins at 6.30 p.m 
with free, pa free face painting and inflatable bouncers. Concessions will be available throughout. The movie will begin at sunset, approximately 8.30 p.m. This is the sixth year that the city has provided this fun community event with the support of the Community Strength Foundation and North Star Lions Club. The second movie this year will be Mona and will take place on Saturday, September 16th. So this is to um, adopt resolution 17-58 to accept a $3,700 donation from the Community Strength Foundation to help fund the two movie and the park events for 2017. Uh, the last item on our consent agenda, <clears throat> certainly not the least, is to approve the Brewer Tap Room on sale Sunday, off sale Sunday for Growlers, Tavern and Small Brewery off sale liquor licensing for Alloy Brewing Company, LLC. Um, Alloy Brewing Company, LLC, has signed a lease for the establishment site. The license and investigation fees have been paid. The police department is in the process of conducting comprehensive background investigations on all owners of the business. A certificate of insurance evidencing liquor liability and workers' compensation coverage has been received. Approval, approval of the license would be conditioned upon successful background investigations, the issuance of a certificate of occupancy from the chief building official, and the final licensing approval from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement Division. So we will be approving the Brewer Tap Room on sale Sunday, off sale Sunday for Growlers, Tavern, and Small Brewer off sale liquor licensing for Alloy Brewing Company, LLC, 2700 Coon Rapids Boulevard, Northwest, contingent upon obtaining successful background investigations, the issuance of a certificate of occupancy from the chief building official, and the final licensing approval from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety, Alcohol and Gambling Enforcement Division. And that is our complete, right, complete consent agenda. Yeah. Council Member Demmer. Move to accept the consent, move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Geisler to approve the consent agenda. Any questions or discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. And I hear we're weeks from having a, weeks from having alloy open. We're getting there. We're getting, we're getting there. there. So we don't have a date yet. No, no, no date, date yet, apparently. Not yet. Soon. <laughs> Very suspenseful. Very suspenseful? <laughs> All right. Next item on our agenda is uh, item 10, uh, to consider planning commission's uh, planning case 17-7, consider approval of ordinance 2188, changing zoning from office to general commercial, 124th Avenue and Ivywood Street by Shamrock Development. Um, this is we uh, this, we introduced this last time, right? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the uh, 6.2 acres consists of four parcels. It has frontage on Main Street, <coughs> Highway 10, and Pickle Lake Boulevard. The site wraps around a cluster of three twin homes, and the bulk of the site is 6.1 acres and located between 124th Avenue and Main Street. The remaining 0.1 acre is made up of three smaller parcels that are somewhat disconnected from the larger parcel, but provide frontage along Highway 10. Adjacent land, land uses include a 25,500 square foot medical office building to the west, Main Street and Menards to the north, three twin homes and Highway 10 to the east, and a single family residential neighborhood to the south. The entire site is currently zoned office. The largest parcel has been zoned office since 1986. The abutting 1.12 acre parcel was changed from high density residential to office in 2007. The two remnant parcels and vacated street easement was, were changed from low density residential to office in 2007. And we are looking at changing this to general commercial. Mr. Harlicker, anything you want to, or Mr. Fernelius, anything you want to cover on this? No, I think you did a good job of covering it. It's all your notes. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> And it went to the Planning Commission, um, held on April 20th. Three residents spoke at the public hearing. They were concerned about how the area behind the twin homes might be developed, uh, the increase in traffic when the property is developed, and the condition of 124th Avenue. Um, it was explained that because of the shape of the lot behind the twin homes, it would not likely be developed. The most likely use would be for stormwater management and parking on the west end. 
and traffic will increase when the property is developed. At this point, specific numbers are not known, and it was explained that the condition of 124th can be addressed as a separate issue from the development of the property, and the commission voted unanimously to recommend approval of the proposed zone change. And, and on May 2nd, we introduced the ordinance, so here we are this evening. Your Honor. Councilmember Johnson. In planning case 17-7, I would move approval of the ordinance 2188 approving the proposed zone change to general commercial based on the four uh, stated findings that are in the agenda. Second. Motion by Johnson, second by Geisler. Discussion? Mayor. Councilmember Griscoviak. This is in Ward 1, so for those that don't know, this is directly across Main Street from Menards. Big vacant lot. And I just wanted to point out that uh, as it is in Ward 1, I've talked to a lot of people in that area over the last year or so, and there hasn't been anyone that uh, brought up a concern on this. I think most people in the area may have already understood that to be a general commercial area in the first place. So I'm not seeing any issue with this change. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Your Honor, I live right down the street. You never talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew there was something percolating in there. <laughs> well, you had your chance to speak, but now you have to forever hold your peace. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Item 11 is to consider resolution 17-23 sub 8, accepting plans and specs for Main Street and Coon Rapids Boulevard LED conversion and authorizing solicitation of bids. Um, Mr. Hammer, you want me to read all this or part of this or do you want to just give us the highlights? Mr. Mayor, I'll give you the highlights. Members of the council, we're looking to go out um, for bid to do direct purchase of street lighting materials for Main Street between Round Lake Boulevard and the Highway 10 interchange and Coon Rapids Boulevard from 93rd Avenue to Trunk Highway 47. This is part one. This would be direct purchase by the city and uh, the next phase will come after award of bids and we will be then uh, hiring electricians to do the installation. The work will take place probably September, October, uh, sometime this fall. And then I can stand for any questions you might have. All right. Um, you know what, Mr. Hammer, and I should have looked at how far we laid this out. Um, how far east on Coon Rapids Boulevard would it go, did you say? to the uh, exit ramps coming off of Highway 47, the west side of Highway 47. Okay, all right. Be Muddy Cow. Okay, all right. Landmark. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was east. The, the, I'm sorry, I meant, I meant west. Yeah. How far west did they go? 93rd Avenue, where they currently stop. Those three globe lights are approximately Flintwood, 93rd Avenue. Okay, all right. Okay, that was, that was, I guess it was a way to bring this up then. It was, um, I had a, we had a resident that's always talking about how dark the area is around Foley and Coon Rapids Boulevard. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how pedestrians will come out, all of a sudden he, when he goes to work, at he works third shift. And as he's going to work in the dark, all of a sudden these people come out of the dark and he's like, you know, and he's just concerned that the area is kind of darker on there. It is. Okay, but that has nothing to do with this, so that'll yep. be a separate note for later. Yes. <laughs> um, Council, any questions, or is everybody going to move this? Uh, yeah. Councilmember Demmer. Um, to accept resolution 17-23 uh, sub 8, accepting plans and specifications for Main Street and Coon Rapids Boulevard LED conversion and authorizing solicitation of bids. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Johnson. Discussion? Mayor, I'll go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say. Well, who's uh, running this? <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor. Councilmember Demmer, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just, just for people at home, we, uh, this, this is a great example of how things that, you know, hey, should we put up new street lights or not? You know, it sounds really simple, and then they bring the catalog. Yeah. <laughs> and there's thousands of choices of street lights, and you have to, you know, there's lumens and, and wattage and just, you know, everything. And, and you can go down really deep. And we had three different meetings to try to find the right, uh, the right combination of cost and, and power of light. And, and just, 
I don't want to make it sound like it was super, super complicated, but it is amazing how much goes on in the back mm -hmm. um, to, to try to put together something that, that makes sense and works where you're trying to make it last a really long time um, so you get the most benefit for the dollars you spend, but also not spend too much up front and, and even on something that seems as simple as light bulbs. So uh, hopefully everyone likes the new designs. We, we tried to get something that, again, wasn't over the top crazy, but was also not just really, really boring. It was uh, a, a back and forth that, that we think ended up with a, a good balance. So um, just kind of the, the insight into what goes on in, in all the work sessions. Councilmember Chris Kroviak. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> Councilmember Uh I, those, those discussions uh, took place before I was on the council. I was in one work session and we're talking about these lights. And the only concern that I have is that Riverdale isn't that old. I think uh, it was opened in 2002 or so. So a lot of those street lights on Main Street over in Riverdale are only 15 years old. And according to the plans and specifications, they, they need to be completely replaced uh, all the way you know the pole the fixture everything but the base and the electricity so I guess while we are looking for bids we need to take that into consideration that the folks that uh, quoted us and provided us those lights uh, only 15 years ago uh, I think are things that we need to take into consideration as we look to replace I just wanted to point that out and that is those lights were part of that Main Street project, so they were part of a construction project. And so when you think of roadway improvements, those are the things that aren't really thought of in that. And so it's the material that they are and the old style high pressure sodium lights that just don't cast the lighting. So because of the salting that they take, um, those poles are rotten. It's not a total re place these are poles that are going to be mounted on the existing bases there's underground uh, wires and conduit that are going to remain so those are going to be just tip the poles up and install them coon rapids boulevard on the other hand is total underground replacement of the electrical so um, it's quite extensive because of those environmental factors but it's not a total redo on main street okay thank you from the time i came onto the onto the council I've been questioning those lights on Main Street because it's so dark up there. They just don't put any, they, they give you a little spot of light on the road about that big around. So it's really going to be fun to have lighting and a welcoming attitude. Or it's just going to feel brighter. more brighter and more welcoming up there. Mr. Mayor, uh, just another brief item. We, we did get a few LED lights that were tossing around for the city standard elsewhere within the city, not along these prominent quarters. I think I mentioned to Council Member Johnson. So we installed one over in a cul-de-sac off of a holly in 101st, I believe it is, 102nd 104th. maybe, yeah. 104th. Uh, and we're going to be putting a few others up in different areas of the city and talking to the people adjacent to those and arriving at a standard that we can start swapping out as they fail or with reconstruction projects. Uh, we're taking it slow to make sure we pick the right ones and we don't get too intrusive with people. Um, but that is in the works as we speak as well. I will tell you it is a much brighter light than what was there in the past. And when we're going into the residential neighborhoods, then we're paying attention to the lumens there because I remember they had that study where over a certain lumen it kind of kept people awake and stuff. Yeah, that's the, the color of the light. And so oh, what okay. we're looking at is trying different lumens or different Kelvin technically um, within the different area. So this one might be 3,000, this will be 3,500, this will be 4,000. Uh, I'm only having them installed in areas that shine on the roadway. So if they're near an intersection that might be close to someone's home, that's not an area where I want to investigate okay. just yet. We'll figure that out later. So if you ever want to know how many council members it takes to change a light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> Turns All out seven. <laughs> Plus one. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any other discussion? Um, and it, we did have a motion and a second, right? All right, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. So item 12 is to consider resolution 17-52, approving a MnDOT agreement number 1028126, a master partnership contract between the state of Minnesota and the city of Coon Rapids and you know what, Mr. Hammer, I'm just going to let you talk about this one again. 
Sure thing, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is uh, an expiring agreement with MnDOT. We entered into this approximately two years ago. Uh, they do things for us on our recon pro projects like plant inspections for concrete and bituminous. Uh, if we ever have a project adjacent to a state highway where there's culvert, it's very extensive in what they can do. It, it just gives us the ability to enter into agreements with MnDOT and vice versa, MnDOT with us without having to go through a whole lot of other formal agreements. I, I consider it similar to what our master contracting agreement is uh, that we have, and there'll be a few more of those coming your way, but this is just directly with MnDOT. It's an expiring agreement. It's just a renewal uh, at their 2017. Okay, thank you. Council? Mr. Mayor? Councilmember Geisler? Um, I will make a motion to approve the master partnership agreement, uh, MnDOT agreement number 1028126 and corresponding resolution 17-52 and authorize city officials to execute the agreement with the state of Minnesota through its commissioner of transportation beginning June 2017 and expiring June 30th, 2022. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Kicker. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. And the next item on our agenda is to consider a joint powers agreement with Anoka County for reconditioning of um, county, is it county state aid highway 14? Is that, that is what, correct. Is that's what that set of initials means? Between county state aid highway 7 and county state aid highway 9, city project 16-18. And this is right up in that uh, Riverdale area, right? Oh, yeah. Um, reconditioning work in Coon Rapids includes flashing yellow arrow conversion of the traffic control systems at the Wedgwood Drive and Round Lake Boulevard intersections. That'll be nice. Mm -hmm. Reconstruction of pedestrian curb ramps to meet ADA standards, curb and gutter and storm sewer casting replacements, concrete median replacement, and mill and overlay of the asphalt pavement on County State Aid Highway 14 from the west city limit with Anoka to Round Lake Boulevard. In addition, a new five foot wide concrete sidewalk will be constructed from Hoffman Way in the city of Anoka to Wedgwood Drive in Coon Rapids and the city maintained segment of Round Lake Boulevard in Coon Rapids from County State Aid 14 to 450 feet south will be mill and overlaid as part of the work. No roadway widening is proposed to take place within Coon Rapids on this project, and the project is proposed to be constructed as shown on the attached Exhibit A. I assume they must have finally worked things out with the city of Anoka on that end, because this was all kind of part and parcel of that same project, and Mr. Stemwell and I went to the open house that night at Federal Cartridge, and we didn't have any issues there. All the issues were on the Anoka side of that project. Uh, city staff has met monthly with the county over the course of their planning efforts for this project and a project open house was held on January 31st, 2017 at the Federal Cartridge Clubhouse in Anoka. The city will pay 100% of the costs for, mill, for the mill and overlay, concrete and storm sewer repairs on Round Lake Boulevard south of 14. In addition, this city will be responsible to pay a portion of the construction engineering on this project, which amounts to 8% of the locally funded items described above. And the total estimated construction cost to the city is $55,181.50. The estimated cost of the city for construction engineering is $4,414.52. The total city share is therefore estimated to be $59,596.02. Anoka County plans to bid the project in July of 2017, with construction taking place between August and November. Anything you want to add to that, Mr. Hammer? Nothing, Mr. Mayor, you did perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from council or somebody want to make a motion? Your Honor. Council Member Kicker. We'll make a motion to uh, that the council approve the joint powers agreement with Anoka County for reconditioning of County State Aid Highway 14 East Main Street between 300 feet east of County State Aid Highway 7, 7th Avenue, and County State Aid Highway 9, Round Lake Boulevard in the cities of Anoka and Coon Rapids. Second. Motion by Kicker, second by Griscoviak. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Item 
item 14 is to consider resolution 17-54, changing the land use designation to General Commercial, 124th Avenue and Ivywood Street, Shamrock Development. Kind of felt like this one should have been right with the other one, <laughs> but uh, uh, nonetheless, here we are. Um, Mr. Mayor? Uh, Council Robert Geisler. I can make a motion in planning case 17-6 the Planning Commission um, to approve the re resolution 17-54 approving the proposed land use amendment from office to general commercial based on our two stated findings. The pro proposed amendment will direct commercial development to a portion of the city with traffic capacity and transit options. Um, the site which was located on Main Street and at the Main Street and Highway 10 interchange supports that policy. And the commercial devel development of the site is supportive of the policy to enhance Riverdale Regional Commercial Area. Second. Motion by Geisler, second by Johnson. And this is a matter of we've changed the zoning and now we need to change the land use to match the zoning. Yep. It is a state requirement. Any uh, discussion on this? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Item 15 is to consider a memorandum of understanding with Youth First Community of Promise. Uh, in late summer of 2016, staff met with middle and high school leadership along with the executive director of Youth First Community of Promise. Youth First Community of Promise service, serves the communities of Andover, Anoka, and Ramsey through partnerships with the schools and cities. Staff brought this opportunity to the November 29, 2016 work session where council gave direction to pursue the opportunity further. A memo of understanding has been drafted for consideration. Um, Mr. Stemmel, you want to hit the highlights or what do you want to do? Sure, I can certainly do that. I should also mention that uh, the executive director of Youth First, Amanda Zappa, is here. So maybe, Amanda, I don't know if you want to step up and uh, maybe introduce yourself and give an overview of uh, the program. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm Amanda Sapa. I'm the executive director of Youth First. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with Youth First, we are a small local nonprofit. Uh, we work with middle school and high school age students. Um, currently, we're serving kids in Andover, Anoka, and Ramsey. Um, looking to add Coon Rapids here very soon. Uh, most of the kids that we work with are considered either at risk or underserved. Um, however, that's not a qualifier for participating in our programs. The programs are open to any youth in that age that want to participate with us. And what we do is we offer free programs uh, during the summer and during the school year. And our goal is really just to help kids succeed, um, to pr provide a safe place for them, um, some caring adults who really want to see them succeed both in school and in life. And so that's our goal here. Amanda, is just the first summer the programming is in Ramsey, or is that the standard summer programming is, would always be in Ramsey? We're going to have to evaluate that after the summer. Um, we want to see what the participation is like from our Coon Rapids students. Um, the plan currently is for a bus stop to um, take start at um, the Coon Rapids Middle School. And the reason we chose to do that is because Coon Rapids Middle School actually has summer school this summer. So it'll be about 150 youth in that building and our bus will be picking up immediately following summer school. So that's gonna be a great feeder for the program. Okay. Um, this year really is just kind of a starting point because the kids in Coon Rapids for the most part are not familiar with Youth First or our programs. So there's gonna be quite a bit of um, marketing and with youth trust building um, to get them involved and interested in the program. As we move forward, um, if there is a large number of students, which I certainly hope there is, then we can look at possibly adding another location in Coon Rapids next summer. Okay, but then during the school year programming, that's in the middle school. In the Correct, yeah, it'll be in the middle school. school and in the high school. And the reason we chose to start at those two locations is because they are the closest to the current teen center. So any of the students who are utilizing the teen center right now then would have a program that they can utilize next year. Anybody else have any questions for Amanda? Oh, Mr. Stemmel? Uh, Mayor and Council, I should uh, mention it sort of is implied, but that um, to the extent you enter into this agreement, and uh, certainly staff is uh, encouraging you to do that, um, but would it end the current teen center programming at Riverwind um, Center up at Northdale? Um, we, we see that as a positive thing. They're able to offer a much more robust programming opportunity than uh, we've been able to offer in, in house the last couple of years. Um, and we think that um, they're a strong organization. Certainly, we look forward to their partnership. So. And when do we anticipate that the teen center would be done then? June 1st. June 1st. Okay. Oh, 
coincide with <laughs> this. Yeah. Right. Mr. Councilmember Wells. Yeah, I know change can be hard, uh, you know, for a lot of people, maybe even uh, more so children, but this is an upgrade for the city. This is going to reach out to far more children and it's going to be, you know, way more effective than what we're currently doing. So I think it's a good thing. Excellent. Any other questions? We're, uh, so let's see, we're looking for authorization. So we, are we looking for a motion to authorize signatures or what are we looking for here? A motion to uh, enter into the MOU and authorize uh, uh, execution of the agreement. All right, Council Member Geisler. I will make a motion um, to enter into the agreement um, and the memorandum of understanding um, to Detail the city's financial commitment of up to ten thousand dollars for the remainder of 2017 and twenty thousand for 2018 um, to cover the costs of the program. Second. Wow, I think a lot more went into that motion than we needed, right? Is, is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> Better have too much than that in our motion. <laughs> All right, uh, we had a motion by Geyser and a second by Wells. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? What? We have, we have a hand. We have a hand. <laughs> Mayor Coates, I was going to mention as well that um, this actually represents a savings for us uh, under the current agreement. We have about $27,000 in the budget for our current teen center programming. And so as it's structured right now, uh, there's the savings uh, annually. And then we'll see as we look at the program in the future. But uh, another positive to consider. All right. <clears throat> Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Um, all right. Item 16. And I think, uh, Mr. Hammer, I'll bet you could just hit the highlights on this, and then I won't have to read all of this text that you printed out. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, we're seeking authorization for a development agreement with Alina Health, uh, Mercy Campus. They are doing their uh, parking ramp expansion and some other associated expansion. As part of that, they were required to construct a right turn lane on Dakota Street at Coon Rapids Boulevard. That roadway is in rough condition. Uh, they're reconfiguring their access, intending to send more traffic down that as well. Uh, so we worked with them to come up with this agreement whereby they would reconstruct it all the way to their south property line. There's a, a parking lot on the west side of Dakota Street. So they will be, they'll be paying for a, a sidewalk along the west side of Dakota Street from Coon Rapids Boulevard down to that southerly property line where there's an existing crosswalk. They will be paying the full cost of the right turn lane and then they will be pay paying a um, comparable assessment to a reconstruction project and the city will be picking up the remainder of that. No other properties are proposed to be assessed as part of this. It's all a line of property. Uh, also contained within this is the understanding that if in the future that uh, Dakota Street and Coon Rapids Boulevard needs to become a signalized intersection because of traffic demand, that Mercy would be responsible for 50% of the city's costs to do so. Uh, pretty straightforward beyond that, and I can stand for any questions. Okay. Councilmember Demmer. I think I understand, but just to clarify, it still is a public street. We still plow it. We still would maintain the surface in the future. They're paying the one-time cost for building it. That's correct. They're just going to piggyback on their existing contract, uh, utilize their <laughs> unit prices that they have. It's as good or better than we'd get with the reconstruction. They're already out there doing it. They can do it as part of their project and then pay the assessment just like they would if it was a city project. Turn lane and a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. That's correct. All right. Care to move this forward? Uh, Your Honor. That's Robert Demmer. Um, move to approve the attached agreement with Alina Health for the reconstruction of Dakota Street from Coon Rapids Boulevard to approximately 600 feet south. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Geisler. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Yeah. Item 17 is to consider resolution 17-55, a call for a public hearing to establish tax increment financing district 1-32, the Riverdale Station Apartments. 
In June 2016, the HRA approved purchase agreements with the Anoka County Regional Rail Authority and Sherman Associates for land adjacent to the Riverdale Transit Station along Northdale Boulevard. Sherman Associates proposes a first phase of 251 apartments in two buildings on about eight acres of the 16-acre site, as well as a small commercial building. A second phase will likely include senior housing on the balance of the site. In April 2016, the council approved a memorandum of understanding with the rail authority in a term sheet with Sherman, which outlined the terms of the real estate transaction and financial package for the project. The terms include creation of a new housing TIF district for the project. For the first phase, the developer would receive increment on a pay-as-you-go basis for no more than 10 years of the 26-year maximum. Up to 10 years of increment would also be provided for phase two. The council is asked to adopt resolution 17-55 to call for a public hearing on creation of the TIF district for the project on July 5th. By that time, the planning commission will have considered a site plan for the project also, the HRA and Rail Authority will consider amendments to the purchase agreements for the project to extend closing dates for the land. Staff also anticipates that a development agreement will be ready for council consideration at that same meeting. At present, Sherman expects closing to occur this fall. In the meantime, staff will prepare the required notices and documentation so that the council can formally consider establishing the TIF district at the time of the public hearing on July 5th. Um, so what we're looking to do this evening is adopt a resolution calling for public hearing. But I have a question before we get to that. When do we deal with the traffic? When do we, because that, that, that was the one big pushback on this whole thing was, what are we going to do with the traffic? And at what point do we deal with that, Mr. Fernelius? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. So that is a, um, that's, a, that's an issue that staff has brought to the attention of the developer. Um, we have asked for an updated traffic study. On Thursday night, the Planning Commission will consider the site plan, and I know that that um, likely will be, ex um, the public hearing will probably be continued into July, um, and that's one of the, excuse me, into June, and that's one of the reasons why, is that we want to know more about the, um, the traffic impacts and how that will be addressed. So. That's a separate matter that, that we'll um, address, and for tonight, this is really the first step in the process related to just establishing the TIF district. Okay. I, just, I want to make sure we don't get too far down this, this road without having addressed that traffic, because that was a commitment we made to those neighbors, That's was correct. that we would look at that. Yep. Yeah. Councilmember Wells. Is there something magical about July 5th? I mean, I look at it, it's a Wednesday night meeting, you know, well, it's following the, the 4th of July. Following the 4th of July, the biggest vacation week in Minnesota. It almost seems like you're having a public hearing when you don't want people to show up. Uh, I mean, if it could be done two weeks later and not affect the timeline or two weeks earlier, it, that just seems like not the best day for a public hearing on something that may have a lot of people that would like to reach out and talk to us about it. Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, you know that I think that's the date that we had identified with the developer, but I believe we could push that out if, if it is. It, it could be changed, and I, I will mention that this this particular public hearing, the, the planning commission will hold the public hearing for the site plan, which I think is the the more interesting thing to the, to the neighbors, and that's where things like traffic and the appearance of the building uh, will be handled. For this public hearing, this is primarily on establishment of the TIF district, and it's simply a requirement by state law that a public hearing be held. So it's not typically uh, a public hearing that we would expect a lot of people at. We, we certainly could uh, go with a different date, but I just wanted to mention that. So help me understand the process. So if, if the Planning Commission, after the public hearing, signs off on the, the site plan, does it come back to council then? And uh, Scott, maybe you could yeah. address the mayor and council. The, the site plan is just requires planning commission consideration. Right. Um, there isn't a, a, a corresponding uh, subdivision plat that's moving through with it. The council will see the plat like they would any other subdivision application. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so 
So it will come back to us then, or it won't. The plat. The plat. The plat will, yes. The site plan um, will not. Only if somebody appeals it. Okay, Mr. Stemmuddle. And then uh, you know, the final component, of course, would be the development agreement, which would need to be approved by council in this okay. case. And then that would be in the fall or well, at closing. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, yeah, Mr. Uh, our, our plan would be, I believe, the same night that we have the public hearing for the TIF district that we would adopt or present a development agreement. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so the business terms as it relates to the purchase price, the TIF assistance that the city would provide, that would be discussed that same evening that um, the, TIF, the TIF district is, the public hearing is held. Okay, because only speaking for myself, I felt there was a very strong commitment made to that those neighbors right. that that this wasn't going to go forward unless there was a plan for the traffic. Correct. So, All right. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Johnson, uh, Mr. Stemwell, what is our meeting that follows the fifth? Uh, it'd be the Tuesday. I have to pull up my calendar here. Eighteenth. Eighteenth. Is there anything that anybody can identify as a problem with moving it to a public hearing on the 18th? Your Honor and, and Councilmember Johnson, I, I, I would say based on our knowledge of the developer's time frame, delaying that public hearing two weeks would not be a, would not present a problem. <coughs> so if, if you wish to uh, hold the public hearing that date instead, we can simply modify that on the resolution uh, you're considering tonight. I would make that motion, Your Honor. All right. Councilmember Wells, so your motion is to adopt Resolution 17-55 calling for a public hearing on July 18th to modify the redevelopment plan for redevelopment project area number one and establish a tax increment finance district 1-32. No, I'll second that. Motion by Wells, second by Johnson. Further discussion? Uh, the hearing on that, that <coughs> hearing then that's going to be solely directed and the focus of that meeting is just on the TIF <coughs> district creating the TIF, TIF district it won't be on site plan or approval or traffic or anything like that it's primarily what is the city's obligation in helping fund this project which we're thinking about opening up a 26 year TIF district and allowing them to uh, take participate in that for 10 years and 10 so that's that will be the focus of that meeting that's right, right. Yeah, Mr. Okay. and to your earlier point the the key is that anyone who is interested in the development the site plan <coughs> is really where you're gonna see what is where are the buildings gonna go what are the buildings gonna look like where is the traffic pattern Right, and so that's what I think, Mr. Hollerker. Correct me if it's wrong. That that is going to start at the planning commission at their meeting this Thursday, but because the traffic study hasn't been completed, they're going to continue that public hearing to their June meeting, which would be the third Thursday in June. So there would be two opportunities for residents to hear and listen about the site plan for that project. And that's such an important important process because I like watching those planning commission meetings mm -hmm. to see what the <laughs> residents have to say about about the, at those public hearings. Yep. Right. Other discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. And that motion carries. And we're at item number 18 to consider resolution 17-57 providing for the sale of ten million dollars general obligation bond series 2017 a and Ms. Leg, do you want me to just read these paragraphs or do you want to hit the highlights on this well maybe I'll just explain it briefly okay um, if I can so what we're proposing is to issue about ten million dollars worth of bonds on June 20th that's what we'd be setting the um, hearing tonight with the resolution um, and what we're paying for with these bonds are about three million dollars worth of street reconstruction projects all the 2017 projects the city share and included in those projects are some water um, improvements so we'd issue water bonds to pay for the water portion of the improvements 
And then what we are also going to do is issue another set of the park improvement bonds. We've been kind of chipping away at these park improvement bonds from the referendum. We're still only at about 7.7 .7 million. There was about 17 million authorized. Um, so we still haven't issued it all, but we kind of fill any gap um, in the financing for the other needs with the park improvement because these interest rates are so low. And then the fourth component would be refunding some outstanding golf bonds. And the purpose of doing that would be is we'd have some interest savings and then also we can restructure uh, the cash flow to kind of maybe push the cash flow off a little bit to give the golf fund a little bit of relief. Uh, but there'd still be savings of about 185000 in interest costs by doing that. So um, that's what the bond issue is being proposed to handle. Okay. Mr. Member Demmer? Um, do you anticipate any impact to city credit rating or anything? And how's, how's $10 million hit the, hit the credit rating? I, I would not assume that would make any impact. Uh, Moody's, who has rated our bonds in the past, they typically say that we have a, on the lower side of outstanding debt. So that, I don't think, will be an impact. Thank you. Uh, uh, make a motion authorizing resolution 17-57, providing for the sale of $10 million in general obligation bonds, series 2017A. Second. Motion by Demmer, second by Griscoviak. Discussion? Mr. Mayor. Council Member Kraskoviak. Uh, thank you, Chair, and for that uh, description there. I think it's worth noting that it's a $10 million bond um, offering here, but a big point of it is that about $3.7 million of it is actually paying back an earlier general obligation bond, giving our city a $185,000 savings by making that move because interest rates are so low. So it's really about a $6.4 million bond uh, issuing, and this is covering uh, the park improvements, street improvements that we're doing this year, and then water main improvements that will be repaid back through the water fund. So uh, definitely a, a good way to go, a nice savings for our city by taking advantage of the low interest rates. All right. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that motion carries. Um, oh. All right, that brings us to open mic. Is anybody here to address council this evening for open mic? All right. Reports on previous open mics. Um, last week, Ms. Joni Brooks appeared um, expressing her concern for the condition of the creek, Tronson Creek, that runs behind her property at 11928 Grouse Street. She stated previous work was conducted by the city, but the creek has since fallen into disrepair and needs additional attention. There were a lot of details. There's a lot of stuff here, but it appears the, uh, the bottom line is we're working with Coon Creek Watershed on this and trying to figure out who's even responsible for it. <laughs> um, and uh, most residents along the creek have established nice buffers and have stopped the illegal dumping. These efforts from adjacent residents have reduced the erosion and runoff, slowing the accumulation of sediment. Um, I'm just not going to jump in there. I'll just stop there. But uh, so it, it sounds like we're going to make some headway at some point here. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, there's a very large easement in the back. Um, fences have come closer and closer. It's just uh, always this constant trickle of groundwater. It's causing some damage to those fences. Some people have moved them back. Some people didn't install any in the first place. Um, we've got some ideas on what we can do now that um, native vegetation is, is an option, which it wasn't in, in the past. Um, but it's going to take some cooperation between both entities as well as those homeowners. Um, they'll have to understand I can't maintain right down to that creek. And that's where some do, some don't, and it gets a little complicated. So. You can't just do part of it. You've got to do it all, and we'll need some cooperation, and we'll work with them to see what we can get done. So uh, the part in here where it talked about watershed uh, was wondering if this was the missing ditch or something. The, the, does this mean that, that, that they will kind of take this on, or is this something that we're going to have to take on? Or I'm just wondering who's going to call the neighbors together to talk to them about 
this is what's available and this is what we what can be done. Right now, Mr. Mayor, that's going to be the city. They're oh. going to participate. As I said in here, it, it's our stormwater conveyance system. We can argue about whether it's a public ditch or not. Uh, in the end, they've put time and energy into it to date, and so have we. We all want the same thing out of it. Uh, I believe the residents do as well. So um, the city will take the lead in that communication, but the watershed will be right alongside us. All right. Well, no questions are on that. We'll move on. Um, and that moves us right to other business. How'd we get here already? Yeah. Nice. Mr. Mayor. We guys, have right? a ton of things coming up in the next couple of weeks or so, right? So tomorrow night from 5 to 7, there's the open house on Port River Walk. Um, so if you, and that's at City Hall, and so if you want to learn more about that project before coming to the open or the public hearing at the Planning Commission meeting on Thursday, you can talk about it twice this week. And then... Thursday, there's the Minnesota Department of Transportation NLX Open House, again here at C City Center from 5.30 to 7.30. Learn more about the Northern Lights Express. Sunday, noon to 4, is the home remodeling tour. So come, I don't know if anybody wants to talk more about what that is, but you can come to the city website, and it's the people who have been doing the homes for generations. Um, and improving the, their homes and they've opened up the houses to see what they've done with their projects and how they've come to improve their houses for the city which is a great and can get really good ideas and then the other big one is next Friday Sand Creek or week from Friday um, is the grand opening for Sand Creek lots of things on our calendar the other another item along with that NLX open house on Thursday is over at Coon Rapids High School, they're having the uh, uh, community meeting from the facility, um, I can't find my notes here. Um, it's, it's about the facility, about Coon Rapids High School, about the addition and the proposed remodeling there, and that's at 6.30 p.m. at Coon Rapids High School. Right, anything else on that? Are you on that facilities committee? I'm not, but you're right, uh, Mayor, it's uh, in regard to the fit for the future. So this um, fall they'll be asking for a special levy to fund these projects, and they're kind of doing this open house as a way to let people know what's going on at Coon Rapids High School, but certainly there are a number of other projects in the district that they'll be uh, speaking to as well. So yeah, they're having, a, they're having this open house um, tomorrow night at Champlin Park, the 18th, Thursday at Coon Rapids, the 23rd at Blaine, the 24th at Andover, and the 25th. At Anoka, so they're they're trying to get around the district, but it'll be this Thursday at Coon Rapids High School. Um, is there anything else? Well, let's, let's get their calendar open over there. Councilmember Geisler, cover it all. Can you get the couple of big ones? Your Honor. All right, Councilmember Kuka. Um, I read the Star, Star Tribune every day, every morning, and um, this morning there was in Athletes of the Week, they, they, they mentioned um, a young freshman, female, Clear Rapids softball player, Sam Lum, she was athlete, one of the Athletes of the Week uh, in the last week. She pitched 16 innings uh, and uh, in four different games, and was 3-0 and um, through her first no-hitter. So this is wow. as a freshman, and, um, and I think bat batted leadoff and, and hit over 400 for the week. So just congratulations <laughs> to her. That was, uh, that was nice to read. Wow. That's John Lum's daughter, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. it is. Yeah. See if she can get onto your team, because that, <laughs> that would help you guys a lot. <laughs> for sure. Tell us where follow up on that. I had the pleasure of meeting her uh, working. She volunteered at the concession stand with us over the weekend and uh, had no idea until I saw it in the paper today that uh, she was such a star athlete, but a uh, very nice young lady, hard worker. And, and I'd like to point out that it is so nice to have a facility that people all over the metro just rave about Sand Creek Park. And the facility had a very large fast pitch tournament there this weekend and stuff. And I know the summer is going to be busy with lots of things. So, but it's nice to have something that the city can be proud of, and, and people really like it. 
Must have been only advice you gave her that caused her to do so well, right? She, I think she'd already done it. Before. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that Sand Creek Park, that actually came up today at that Twin City Visitors Bureau meeting. That wasn't confidential, right? There's there's only two facilities in the region or in this area that had that offer six fields like that for tournaments, and the other one's down in Burnsville. So this is really a coup for us to have this up here to attract the big tournaments. Here, here. All right. Any other business to come before council? Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to make a note that uh, Epiphany has its annual Spring Fest event coming up this weekend. It's a big community event. It's going on uh, Friday and Saturday and a little bit of Sunday this weekend. That's right. We get that that Armed Forces Proclamation will be read at 2 p.m. in the afternoon right. with the Army Band. <laughs> All right. No other business? Move to adjourn. Well, one oh. last thing I spoke. Okay. I think we talked about it in the past, but uh, before we meet again, Memorial Day, uh, uh, activities will be at oh. uh, both Morningside and at Bunker Hills Park. Uh, if you haven't been to those, they're extremely well done. Yeah. Usually have excellent speakers and stuff, so they'll be whatever that Saturday is. I believe it's the 27th, the day after the grand opening. Yeah, yeah. last year the, at the uh, Morningside Park, one of the gentlemen there went through and gave us a history of all of these old weapons from the different wars, and it was fascinating, you know. Fired a round off in each one. <laughs> it was impressive. Council member kicker. Happy birthday, Mayor. No, oh, thank you. I thought I'd throw that out there. I'll second. Right. Okay. <laughs> thank you. And on that one, no, don't move to adjourn. I'll second that too. <laughs> All right, motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned. <laughs>